We have a very busy month this month at the Office of Religious Life, and uh, there's several events that may be of interest to you. They're all free and open to the public, so hopefully you'll get an opportunity to check some of them out. Uh, the first is an exhibition uh, called Artifacts from the Migrant Trail of Southern Arizona, where we have um, essentially um, things that have been left behind in the deserts of S Southern Arizona by migrants. It's a very moving exhibition that's been sort of curated by Southern Arizona artists. It's uh, always open at the Kilgore Chapel at the University Religious Center. You can just come by and see the exhibition whenever you want. Uh, tomorrow night, we're doing an event called Bible Boot, Boot Camp, What the Bible Says and Doesn't Say About Homosexuality with the LGBT Resource Center. That's VKC 101 at 7 p.m. Uh, on Friday, uh, if you knew and loved beloved USC professor Dallas Willard, who was at USC for over 50 years in the School of Philosophy, uh, he passed away last semester, and we're doing a celebration of life, a memorial service for him. That's Friday at 4 p. Uh, sorry, at 3 p.m. at the Crusoe Catholic Center, and you can just show up for that if you're interested. Um, on uh, 10, 8, October 18th, we're hosting uh, Greg Boyle, Father Gregory Boyle of Homeboy Industries, one of the great. Uh, faith-based social justice leaders in our city. Uh, that's also at the Crusoe Catholic Center at 7 p.m. on October 18th. Uh, we're also hosting on October 18th at 7 p.m. at Bovard, uh, Richard Dawkins, the well-known public atheist, to talk about his autobiography. Uh, on October 21st, we're hosting the Sufi master, Pir Zia Anayat Khan of the Chisti Sufi lineage. It's an amazing opportunity to meet a really respected Sufi leader. Uh, that's 7 p.m. DML 240. Uh, October 23rd, we're hosting a divinity school if you're, fair. If you're interested in divinity school or religious education or clerical training or to be a scholar of religion, uh, please come to our divinity school fair. We'll have representatives from Harvard, Chicago, Yale, Claremont, Emory, uh, the Jesuit School of Theology, et cetera. Um, once again, 1023 noon, we'll serve a free lunch uh, at the Trojan Presentation Room. That's Student uh, Union B3. It's uh, in the basement. And finally, on October 24th, we're hosting my friend and colleague, Reza Aslan. He'll be talking about his new book, Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth. It's uh, on the uh, New York Times bestseller list. It was the number one book in the country this summer. Um, and that'll be at 7 p.m. on 1024. That's a lot of information. It's all on our website, the Office of Religious Life website, ORL.USC.edu. And we hope to see you at some of these events. Uh, before we begin, I'm just going to ask everyone during our questions and answers session uh, to use the microphones up front so we can get you on the video. You can just walk up and ask your question. Uh, as you all know, one of the great things about our series is student participation in picking and choosing the speakers and in introducing the speakers. So I'm really excited to introduce a second year um, Masters of Social Work student, um, George uh, Sadakane, who will introduce today's speaker, Rafael Angulo. So please uh, join me in welcoming George. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm a second year MSW student. I had the opportunity to have Professor Angulo for my first year seminar. And um, for me, as a spiritual person, it was nice to have a connection with someone else who honors all forms of spirituality. Um, during our first year seminar uh, course, we're supposed to use that time to talk about what's going on in our internships in our program and to watch him talk to different students about what they were experiencing holding that sacred space about if there were any concerns with supervisors or if the internship wasn't going well. It was nice to see someone who was willing to work with the student where they were at and find a way to, um, as he says, if there's a rupture, repair it. And so for me, um, just watching him always be available for professional consultation, always being willing to value multiple perspectives in our seminar classes, which sometimes, depending on the faculty, is not always possible, <laughs> but I was um, really grateful to have him as my seminar professor. Um, one thing he usually does at, at the beginning of every class is what they call art as meditation, and that was a time for us to, you know, whether it was to bring in music or poetry, um, he was willing to um, allow the students to bring in different forms of things that help them to be in the present moment and to tap into what they were feeling. So it was nice to watched that as well, and it helped me as a professional social worker because it makes you understand why it's important to connect with where the person is at whenever you're working with a client or a patient, depending on the setting you're in. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Rafael Angulo. Uh, good afternoon. 
everybody. It's truly an honor and a pleasure to be invited uh, by the Office of Religious Life and specifically uh, Varun. Thank you, George, for um, sharing a little bit about yourself and the meaningfulness that my class has on you. It's truly, for me, an honor whether you're here by accident or you're here um, coming to hear a little bit of what I want to dialogue and share with you about. My name is Rafael Angulo. I've been an associate professor here at the School of Social Work, now entering my 13th year. I am a social worker and a filmmaker by training. Um, I teach a media and social work course called Media and Social Work Documentary Filmmaking as a Practice for Social Justice. And its intended impact is truly to teach social workers the fundamentals of filmmaking for purposes of larger social change or part of a larger social movement. The belief, this fundamental sense that narratives and aesthetics have the capacity to change minds and hearts, the research is very clear on this matter in terms of storytelling and its capacity to truly provoke someone into thinking a second time. So that's just a little bit about me in terms of background, but the topic and the title of this series, What Matters to Me and Why, was one that really provoked me for several months as before Varun had, or after Varun had shared with me in terms of wanting to come here and speak. I had the opportunity of giving the commencement address to the School of Social Work and it was much more methodical in terms of sharing with the students. Here it seems much more informal, so with your permission, I want to be much more informal than formal. I want to begin, though, with sort of an artist's meditation, as George had stated. I'd like to begin with how artists capture the joy and tragedy of what it means to be human, of what it means for us to feel betrayed and to love and to lust and to be courageous and to be scared and fearful. This poem is a poem that I've shared um, with my classes in the past, but I, I want to be able to sort of share with you it's by Vern Rutsala, and the poem is called Shame. This is the woman of the, of, this is a shame of the woman whose hand hides her smile because her teeth are so bad. Not the grand self-hate that leads some to razors or pills or swan dives off beautiful bridges, however tragic that is. This is a shame of seeing yourself, of being ashamed of where you live and what your father's paycheck lets you eat and wear. This is a shame of the fad and the bald, the unbearable blush of acne, the shame of having no lunch money and pretending you're not hungry. This is a shame of concealed sickness, diseases too expensive to afford that offer only the cold one-way ticket out. This is a shame of being ashamed, the self-disgust of the cheap wine drunk, the lassitude that makes junk accumulate, the shame that tells you there is another way to live, but you're too dumb to find it. This is a real shame, the damned shame, the crying shame, the shame that's criminal, the shame of knowing words, knowing words like glory are not in your vocabulary, though they litter the Bible you're still paying for. This is a shame of not knowing how to read and pretending you do. This is a shame that makes you afraid to leave your house, the shame of food stamps at the supermarket when the clerk shows impatience as you fumble with the change. This is a shame of dirty underwear, the shame of pretending your father works in an office as God intended all men to do. This is a shame of asking friends to let you off in front of the one nice house in the neighborhood and waiting in the shadows until they drive away before walking to the gloom of your house. This is a shame at the end of the mania for owning things, the shame of no heat in winter, the shame of eating cat food, the unholy shame of dreaming of a new house and car, and the shame of knowing how, such, how cheap such dreams are. So I'm wondering if ever in our life we have felt that sense of deep shame in regards to who we are, who we belong to, who we come from. 
I am a social worker, first and foremost. And the most important word within this title, I want to argue, is social. And when I begin to reflect on what matters to me and why, I want to talk a little bit about my experiences sort of has led me to this deeper understanding of relationality. It's a concept that's being utilized now in psychotherapy, architecture, education, political science, et cetera. Loneliness is terrifying. Loneliness is a very deadly killer. And I'll explain a little bit what I mean by that specifically. But I've begun to sort of confront the myth of independence coming from a family from Mexico who immigrated to the United States without papers. Very much the Latino culture, very embedded in familia, very much embedded in this relationality between immediate family, extended family, community, and finding myself sort of butting heads, if you will, with a larger culture of a rugged individualism, a culture that states that it is by your own will that you succeed, and if you don't, it's your own decision that you've not succeeded. And so there's a certain shame even in asking for help, that the word dependence has taken on a life of its own, meaning that any sense of dependency I may have on others implies something mortally flawed within me as a human being. And yet I would venture to say that all of you are here for a reason because of your dependence on family, on partners, on religious affiliation, on social supports, etc. You didn't just sort of come here on your own free will as if you were some sort of island. On the contrary, you had others support you in your growth and in your advancement to be here at the school at USC and in various other schools here within this university. And part of the rationale, I think, besides sort of this sort of do it on your own sort of understanding of the American ethos, is a stronger sense of the horror of the other. Meaning that somehow if you are different from me, there's something horrific about you. That somehow we put into place this sort of fundamental understanding that because you're gay or lesbian or Republican or Democrat or Marxist or black or Latino or white, you fill in the blank. That we already construct a model of the other person that says you are a whore. There's something horrific about you because of your difference. And this inability to be radically inclusive, this inability to sort of allow others to enter our lives and the lives of the groups that we're associated with, perhaps, could be one of the major indicators for violence, whether that be violence in communities, war between nations, or the ultimate form of violence, genocide. Years ago, I had the opportunity of doing research in Bali, Indonesia. Bali, for those of you who may not know, is a predominantly Hindu island in the Indonesian archipelago. A small island that has a deep sense of relationality with each other. And what I wanted to do was study parental methods of discipline, perceptions of child abuse on the island of Bali. Gregory Bateson, Margaret Mead had done prior research on a whole array of areas in terms of gender role and family. But what I wanted to sort of explore was how do the Balinese look at children? How do they explore the concept of child abuse? And what are their methods of discipline it's a very sort of exotic island, and it just fascinated me. So I went there, along with the assistance of the Indonesian consulate in terms of translating 
my survey into Balinese. I spent uh, nine months on the island, and from the moment you get there, there's this incredible sense of hospitality, the sense of the sacredness of the other. And as I began to sort of meet with Balians, who are sort of uh, Balinese healers, and go to what we call Banjars, which are Balinese villages, I got the real strong sense that the sense of children being sacred, the sense of children being included as part of the community through the rituals and traditions of the Indonesians and their practice of Hinduism. That is to say that within Balinese life, there are 16 rituals and traditions from the moment of conception to adolescence. 16. That's a remarkable number when you begin to sort of compare and contrast with the number of sort of rituals and traditions. You can count birthdays, obviously, quinceañeras, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, and other sort of religiously orientated rites of passage. For the Balinese, 16 separate rituals and traditions. That's one. The second is the banjar, the village. This provided incredible amount of support in moments in which the mother or the father felt very much stressed. You know, they may have a field, agriculture, some sort of craft. Many of them are artisans, perhaps not being able to make enough money, child is causing problems. And what are those other avenues, those protective factors that allow the Balinese to say, can you help me? So these banjars, these villages, are very strongly inclusive in terms of I will take care of your child. And so what I found through the research were very low incidences of child abuse, for one, very high social capital index, two, but also, these rituals and traditions had the capacity of not only transforming the village, but also the individual. And so when I would interview many of the adolescents and early adults who remembered a lot of the rituals and traditions, they spoke about it in ways that reaffirmed not only their uniqueness, but also their ability to want to leave that same legacy to their own children and to their children's children. That strong social support was that buffer to allow them to deal and to adjust, to become adaptive to the stressors within Balinese society. The Balinese have experienced a whole array of problems, a whole array of major political issues in the 1960s you had literally hundreds of thousands of communists or communist allies who were killed in Jakarta and Indonesia, and those memories continue to haunt the Balinese today. You've had numerous um, bombings in Bali, especially in Kuta, Bali, um, in which many people died, Australians in particular, but Balinese as well. And you have Bali being transformed into a very touristy sort of island, and yet, and yet it retains that unique sort of splendor of social support where it's not lost amid sort of commercialism and this sort of crass consumerism by others. So when tourists come to Bali, there is not that sense of the horror of the other. There is this sense of appreciation for those who come their way to explore the temples, the language, the music. And they're appreciative, obviously, in many ways because of the financial support that tourists provide. But I'm wondering to myself if here in America we have that same sort of approach an understanding of our tourism here in the United States. Someone from Germany, someone from Asia, someone from Africa. I'm not exactly certain that same sort of understanding and appreciation holds 
I could be wrong. And I think many of us here as individuals appreciate someone, oh, you're from Kenya, welcome. You know, you're from Denmark, we'd love to talk with you. So in terms of individuals, yes, in terms of a larger culture, I'm not exactly certain. And so we're challenged in the same way that in the great movie, Guess Who's Coming Over for Dinner, in which you had Katherine Hepburn um, and Spencer Tracy, who were these very white, privileged couple with a wonderful daughter who had just completed college. And she was about to announce to them that she was getting married, her fiance was gonna come over. Um, they were owners of a newspaper in San Francisco, very sort of left of center, progressive, liberal, if you will. And here comes Sidney Potier, this great African-American actor. He is her fiance. And in that moment in time, you saw from that perspective of privilege of these who were very accepting of others, they recognized in Sidney Potier the horror of the other. Oh my God, he's black. He's black. And so this deeper sort of realization that they had this misunderstanding or this sort of fundamental sort of sense of the other as being completely different from who they were. He was a brilliant doctor. And it took time throughout the movie for them to be able to accept not only his brilliance, his sensitivity, but also his race, his blackness, what they called the horror of the other. What's happening today, I think, in terms of the social service research and what the sciences are telling us is what happens when we begin to sort of accept and engage in relationship and in conversation with others on a deeper level. And I'm not just sort of talking about sort of nice to know you, you know, my best friend is Latino, my best friend is white, my best friend is black. I'm talking about a deeper sort of understanding and a deeper sort of engagement with that other person who is different from you who also has the capacity to provide that greater social support in a way that perhaps has not been felt before. Robert Putnam, one of the great sort of social scientists who's looked at issues regarding engagement and social support, has developed a social capital index and he's looked at various states and cities within the US and abroad in coming to this understanding of what makes these particular cities high on the social capital index. There's three things that stand out for him. One of them are structured activities, meaning that whether it be religiously affiliated, non-religiously affiliated, non sort of religious, spiritual, um, numerous sorts of fraternal organizations, that if there's these structured activities on a consistent basis, meaning regular meetings, that which is number two, who share a common need, which is number three, the capacity of the happiness index increasing dramatically rises exponentially. This capacity of social support, especially with others who are very different from us, has this incredible ability to not only change our well-being and happiness, but also in regards to our health. I wanted to sort of share with you some of the research in regards to social engagement. Social isolation in childhood is associated with increased risk for cardiovascular disease in adulthood the link between isolation and disease in adulthood. This one very much related to you. 
college students separated from family and friends are at high risk for suicide. Children given caring relationships, high expectations, and opportunities to participate grow up most resilient. Scientists warn isolation is tightly linked with disease, abuse, and poverty. Seniors living alone have twice as much risk for heart disease as seniors living in communities. Community involvement is strongly correlated with longevity and wellness. Listen to this one. The magnitude of risk associated with isolation is comparable with that of cigarette smoking. And cities whose residents are most isolated have the highest rates of depression. And so the social in social work begins to manifest for me in a very different sort of way. Is it possible that being able to create communities of engagement can reduce symptoms of depression, anxiety, etc.? Is it possible that greater social support can reduce child fatalities, child abuse and neglect in the county of Los Angeles? Is it possible that our learning within a university classroom setting can be enhanced by professors using relational models of instruction? Is it possible that students within LAUSD in our most impoverished areas of Los Angeles, whose standardized test scores are among one of the lowest in the nation, because of relational principles within the classroom setting, are able to increase their test scores rather significantly. I want to make the argument that this is worth researching, and I want to make the argument that some of the social science research suggests that it absolutely can. So I want to share with you a possibility, especially if there are any other professors here, but also for those of you who are engaged in group work, leadership development, and things of that sort, how is it that we can bring disparate groups together, let's say, in one event, in one sort of setting, as opposed to sort of the traditional sort of, you know, icebreaker, you know, where you share the latest movie, the best book you read, and I have no problems or issues with that because it is a way of sort of allowing us to sort of get to know one another. But what if the conversation began to get deeper as an icebreaker? This sort of notion came to me in what we call the Get Empathy Campaign. The Get Empathy Campaign is a program that I'm associated with. I'm on the board of directors of a center called the Relational Center that studies mental health from a very relational perspective looks at social movements and larger public education campaigns, specifically in regards to bullying and the work with LGBT population. And what's currently happening right now is LAUSD is inviting this Get Empathy campaign to come to their schools and to allow students who really don't know each other to be able to tell their story, their narrative, in a way that's not superficial or shallow, but much deeper. What scares you? What do you fear? What do you love? Share with the small group those moments where you felt betrayed, vulnerable, isolated. And so you begin to sort of share this dialogue amongst, amongst groups that may be privileged, not privileged, rich, poor. 
And something incredible begins to happen at that moment where they begin to sort of become empathic towards one another's story. And tears begin to fall. Transparency begins to open itself up, a deeper vulnerability, and you are not a horror to me anymore. There's something beautiful about who you are, almost as if with a mirror showing you are beautiful. There's something ennobling about you. And I've never heard your story. For me, you're always a faggot. You're always a queer. You're always this. You're always that. And now you're more because of the narrative and the story that you're sharing in this Get Empathy campaign. So I want to suggest two questions that if you're in any sort of setting to begin to sort of articulate this to the group. I want you to pose two very provocative sorts of questions. What gets you up in the morning and what keeps you up at night? What gets you up in the morning and what keeps you up at night? And as certain as I am that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, all of us have a rhyme and reason for getting up each morning. But we don't know it. We don't share it. And all of us have a reason sometimes for unable to go to sleep, to sort of tossing and turning in bed, that which keeps us up at night, and we don't share it. The very humanity that we share is left isolated. And the moment you begin to sort of construct these questions and allow other people to share with each other, something remarkable happens in the room. You are not an other. It is we. It is we. And to sort of use you know, post, um, Descartes, you know, I think, therefore, I am. You know, we are, therefore, I am. Individually, we have become who we are in direct relation to we. We are, therefore, I am. And so our task, I think our journey, is how do we become leaders in developing sort of this greater, deeper dialogue and conversation so that we become empathic towards one another, that we become socially engaged with each other in a deeper way that rises to the level, not of shallowness, not of superficiality, but of two human beings and groups longing to understand one another and saying we share the same journey. Just to finish, Martin Buber has this sort of wonderful, wonderful line. In the beginning is the relationship. That in of itself, I think, tells stories, narratives. And we come together at this moment, you know, being able to sort of hear my particular story in terms of what matters to me and why. Because isolation, I think, threatens our civilization in ways that we cannot always see. Physical health, mental health, that social isolation will deeply divide us into factions and into groups. And this is where I think social work is that noble calling of being able to broaden the community, the circle of community where we begin to sort of invite others and say, you are us. You are not an other. You are us. So with that, thank you very much. So I, we have about uh, 10, nine minutes. So I'm wondering if anything sort of rises to the surface. Um, in terms of a feeling, 
a thought, a question. Um, I want to, at the very least, be able to sort of dialogue with you. What resonated with you? Um, did anything sort of provoke you in a sort of deeper way? I know the mics are out there for, for that purpose. So I'm wondering if anybody wants to sort of be the bold one um, and, and talk perhaps a little bit about maybe you've made some connections in your own personal life um, with what I've been talking about, um, how it relates with you. Um, so any, any, any th thoughts? Social work schools right now, we're really pushing for things like cognitive behavioral therapy and, and having all these manuals and teaching our students how to carry out therapy. Are we moving in the wrong direction? Should we be embracing Harry Sack Sullivan and thinking more about just creating healthy relationships and, and that will result in healthy minds? I mean, what, what are your thoughts as an educator in social work? Yeah, I, I really could not agree with you more. I think that there's something, CBT is important. Sure. Um, we're training our students in it. But there's this new model called relational psychotherapy that begins to sort of bring in, instead of a one-person psychology, I am the therapist. I will interpret. I will provide insight. And I am sort of the sage on the stage, so to speak. Um, and so this one-person psychology is now really, be, it's be, we're beginning to rethink that and beginning to sort of articulate a two-person psychology where there is a sacred ground between the both of us and the way that manifests itself is that I, as a therapist who was trained not to be transparent and not to disclose, am now transparent about how I feel about you at the moment. You know, I really appreciate the fact that you came up because I was feeling a little like, oh my God, is anybody going to ask me a question? So that made me feel really good that you did that. So as a therapist, I would be sharing a little bit about myself and what's rising in the moment. And that particular sort of experience between the both of us manifests itself not only in the present moment, but in other relationships as well. She's beginning to sense, you know, that her and I are connected in a deeper way than just insight and interpretation. Now what's happening is a form of attachment that's healthy and that you may have very sort of disorganized attachment styles. And now you're beginning to sort of learn vulnerability because I'm not only modeling it, but I'm allowing you to do the same thing. And so this is also happening within group psychotherapy in which I'm not sort of providing the psychoeducational material, but I'm allowing the group to sort of share their own stories and I'm sort of back off and we begin to sort of perceive each other's needs and share, you know, what you just shared with me deeply moves me. Or, you know, I'm feeling disconnected from you right now. What's happening? And you may respond, well, you, I said something, and you just minimized what I just said. Let's go back to that. I want to apologize for that, you know. So do you see what I'm saying? So it's a much deeper relational model that is beginning to sort of really take form in many of the minds of social workers. But, yeah, CBT and other models um, are much more technique-focused. And while they would never deny relationship, I, I don't want to say that, but there's something empowering about the relational model. Do you think there will be a shift in curriculum down the line that there will be more emphasis on the relationship? Because it's not really being emphasized in our practice classes and um, You're right. There, there's a couple of us who are wanting to move in that yeah. direction. And we're going to be having trainings and opportunities in relational Great. psychotherapy at the School of Social Work. Great. So uh, I definitely want to make you, you know, privy to that. Yeah. And, and um, allow you know these opportunities to sort of manifest themselves within the school, but it's that's a really good question. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for yeah. your answer. Yeah. And any other uh, thoughts, questions? This obviously you spent nine months in a Hindu culture, and uh, were you raised in a Catholic? Just guessing. Um, Catholic culture? I, uh, yeah, I, I was um, raised as a Catholic. I studied to become a priest. Um, I was in the seminary for eight years um, and eventually felt that God was calling me to become a husband and a father. Um, so that was a very difficult decision for me to make. Uh, many of um, my superiors, meaning priests, uh, were expecting me to continue and to become ordained. 
Um, so social work made sense to me when I left. It, it was, if you will, the only profession I could enter that had a sense of hospitality, of spirituality, of engagement. Um, so um, that, that is my, my background and one that um, I currently embrace as well. Yeah, thank you, Claude. Thank you. Yeah. You've trained sort of a generation of new filmmakers who are coming out of social work to tell new types of stories and think about how these stories can push a uh, social agenda. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen in this process with our students in terms of film as a way of creating that type of radical empathy that you're discussing? Yeah, that's a great point. I, I, I think that learning uh, becomes less um, formal and deeply experiential. So what happens, instead of sort of writing that 15 to 20 page final, what's happening is that students are engaged in documentary filmmaking where they have to experience the other. They have to interview them. They have to go to their location. So for example, a documentary that I'm thinking about right now is one in regards to um, undocumented workers who are on street corners looking for work. What is that like to go to their location? What is that like to be in conversation? They got up at 4.30 in the morning to have a camera next to the bedside of his man and his daughter who were rising up right before sunrise. Something incredible happens. That learning curve shoots way up as opposed to sort of writing the midterm or the final. Yes, I'm four midterms, I'm four finals, but there's something incredibly powerful about this capacity to experientially learn about the other through the medium of documentary filmmaking. And so students say, you know, uh, every year that this class had the capacity of allowing them to learn about a subject matter that they weren't very familiar with in a completely different way that touched the visual nerve, this, you know, different sensory nerves, et cetera. We also find you know, multiple ways of other ways of using film, digital storytelling, participatory video. Digital storytelling is where I bring together, for example, youth in foster care who are 15, 16 years, years of age. They bring in their pictures, their music, and they write a narrative and they share this five minute story that they've never shared before about what it was like to be placed in protective custody by law enforcement in which there's five brothers and sisters were placed in different foster homes, each one of them, and weren't able to see each other for months and months. And what happens is through the storytelling, they begin to reframe it in a different way, sort of going back to the event, making it deeply emotional, personal, but sometimes reframing the event and says, it's made me stronger. I'm much more connected with my siblings than I ever was before. Patersapori Viria, just the very last comment that I'll make, brings together two disparate groups where they share and write their own script um, and they direct and edit. So Israelis and Palestinians, Catholics and Protestants in Ireland, two different gangs in South, in the San Fernando Valley. And this participatory video is deeply relational, deeply engaging, as is digital storytelling, where you begin to share their story. And what begins to emerge, the process is much more important than the product, is that we share the same story. And now, yes, you are Palestinian. Yes, you are Israeli. But in many ways, we share greater similarities than we have differences. And I think film is really beginning to capture the relational element, not only of the learning curve, as Varun was suggesting, but also in terms of bringing two people together or being able to share your own personal stories in a different way as opposed to just talk. I believe in talk very, very much. But something about the aesthetic of film, of pictures, and being able to tell a story is where it's at. So I know it's 12.52, so Varun was very clear with me that uh, some of you have to go to class. So I really want to thank you so much for the attention, um, and I hope that I've provoked um, some sort of new thinking and being able to really develop 
um, sort of a, a deeper understanding of relationality um, here at USC and outside of USC as well. So thank you very much. Let's hear it again for Raphael for that poignant and really inspiring talk. Um, Want to thank you all for coming. Please grab some more food on your way out. Uh, and please join us next month where we'll be uh, hosting Vincent Vigil, uh, the executive director of the LGBT Resource Center. So thank you. Fight on. <laughs>